Right then, hello, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever it is, wherever you happen to be. My name is Paul, I'm also called Knickknack, and the brains behind Knickknack's Daily Teaser, which you can view on my blog, Knickknack's Old Peculiar, or here on my YouTube channel, at MrCuddy2977. Thanking you in advance for subscribing, and thanking you for dinging the notification bell. That way, you'll get the quizzes when I release them. You'll also see my movie reviews when I do the rare one. You'll also see my TV reviews as and when I post them. I say that because that's what I'm going to tell you about tonight. It's a TV show I've been watching. For the past few weeks, I've been catching the second series of Good Omens. Uh, and last night, on the 8th of September, I caught the third episode, I Know Where I'm Going. I wanted to tell you about it. <laughs> I Know Where I'm Going opens with a shot of Gabriel, John Hamm, in his rooms at a Xerophile shop, enjoying a quiet drink before he starts making a hell of a mess of the shop before he starts the day. Over the road at Nina's coffee shop, at least one customer notices two things. One, Nina, Nina Sasania herself, is seriously out of sorts. The other, that there's someone in a very strange policewoman's uniform heading for a Xerophile's bookshop. That pretend policewoman is the junior angel Muriel, Quellen Sepulveda, sent a spy on Aziraphale, Michael Sheen. Aziraphale manages to persuade his old pal Crowley, David Tennant, to do something for him. 1. Loan Aziraphale the car. 2. Mind the shop for a couple of days. Aziraphale wants to go travelling to far off sunny Scotland. <laughs> Now, what did I make of all this then? Of, I know where I'm going. What did I think? What can I guess about it? First things first. Muriel, the angel that visits Aziraphale's bookshop, is a rather obscure... <sighs> I'm tempted to say real-world figure, but she's a... a genuine piece of mythology, or real-world mythology, uh, from at least one bit of... Christian writing, and she's seen as the angel that runs hell, or she's seen as the angel that turns into a badon, an angel that runs the abyss. And that first gets mentioned, funnily enough, in the book of Job, played in the clue, the last episode, by Peter Davison. Uh, there's other things that crop up in the episode. The main ones, or the main thing that caught my eyes. Woven into I Know Where I'm Going is another minisode, one called The Resurrectionists. One that tells us a short story of a brief visit Crony and Aziraphale made, for, made to Edinburgh during the late 1820s, where they find a pair of body snatchers plying their trade. Now, the first thing that caught my eyes is simply that the words Resurrectionists is used accurately. It was a term for body snatchers at the time, uh, and it was a term for those people who famously supplied doctors and anatomists with fresh corpses, no questions asked. There were only so many legally available corpses back then, and usually those were from the prisons that carried out hangings. A prisoner's body after the event was given to the anatomists for experimentation. It was considered a an extra deterrent, as well as a way of keeping physicians supplied, and I imagine keeping prisons with an extra bit of cash for all the uh, goodies, so to speak. It's amazing what a childhood fascination with Burke and Hare can do for you, at any rate. On top of that, the Resurrectionist section includes a brief discussion between Aziraphale and Crowley, where Aziraphale says that humans can only be truly ho holy if they've got also got the chance to be wicked. Elspeth, the body snatcher in I Know Where I'm Going, or the main body snatcher in I Know Where I'm Going, is truly wicked as she's not chosen any other option. Which Crowley argues is nonsense, because it only works really if everyone gets the same chance. She hasn't had the chance to choose other options. Xerophel's answer is that's where it really works for the poor. They get more opportunities. Which is lunatic, said Crowley. No, no, said Aziraphale. That's ineffable. I could possibly go on, but I would possibly need a lot more time and a lot more theological knowledge than I've actually got. 
My point is simply this, that those words were lifted directly from the original Pratchett and Gaiman novel, page 41 of my 1993 Corgi Books version. Speaking as somebody concerned that the source of material would be forgotten, I really needn't have worried. Seeing this scene reassures me that at least one of the producers, Neil Gaiman himself, who was the co-order of the first book, knows what he's doing. On other things, or on other fronts, I should say, there are possibly other things to add. Not that I want to do the rest of the ensemble cast down here, but David Tennant was impressive and managed to pull off depending on how you count it, either two or three different accents during the episode. The English one he usually uses for Crowley and his version of Doctor Who, uh, and at least one and possibly two Scottish accents. I was very impressed with the man, the way the man switched from one to another and to what sounded like a third. Um, quite effortlessly. Quite, quite effortlessly. He did a great job, as it should be added, did Michael Sheen. Um, there are possibly sarcastic comments about Sheen channeling Derek Nimmo there, but frankly, and I will be honest here, I don't think anyone else could have been cast as the show's resident angel. The character's arc, the character's very naive optimism is very safe here. It really is. It's impossible to see anyone else playing the part. Yes, this show has a very good ensemble cast, but its two leads have been carrying the show quite effortlessly. There is also possibly more, or possibly much more than I've spotted and talked about here. But as a minor question for my fellow Terry Pratchett fans out there, do we think Aziraphale's bookshop is connected to Elspace? The mystical pocket dimensions that Pratchett invented that connect book collections to other book collections. I don't know, but it's something I'd appreciate hearing your views about. Another question, and this really is possibly up there with the uh, what culture style cetacean observations. Has anyone noticed Crowley's number plate? The, the one on the car, the Bentley, the one that spells curtain backwards. What on earth is going on there? I don't know that either, I'll be honest with you, and I'm sure I've missed something about it. But at any rate, I am still enchanted at the end of uh, I Know Where I'm Going by Good Omen Series 2. Does that mean I'll be watching another episode? Does that mean I'll be watching the fourth one? Of course it does. I'll be watching that fourth episode next week on Friday the 15th of September. I will be posting my written and video reviews of it on Saturday the 16th of September, and I would frankly love it if you joined me. I will see you then. I will hope you subscribe and ding the bell and look at this post on Knickknacks Old Peculiar, and I will see you then. And I will leave you with the immortal words of the ever-mysterious Patrick McGoohan when he said, Be seeing you. Right, just in case you're interested, in Terry Pratchett's Discworld novels, Elspace is where large connections of books are connected to each other. The library here is connected to the, the bookshop there, what have you. The basic equations go like this. Books hold knowledge. Knowledge equals power. Power equals energy. Energy, through a very well-known set of equations, equals mass. Enough mass distorts space. Bookshops and libraries are very genteel black holes that are interconnected to other black holes and know how to read.